Uh, I'm going to introduce our first panel of the day. We've got three current or former athletes doing really interesting things in business. Wonderful to have all three of them. First up, from our friends at UBS, it's Wale Ogunleye, who is with the Sports and Entertainment Industry Group at UBS. Bring it up, bring it up. I'm just going to hide this other mic that I don't think we need. Okay, next up, from the NWSL, and she made this year's Olympic team, it's Midge Purse. Give it up for Midge. And finally, our very exciting late addition to the panel, it's Marcus Colston, who you will certainly know from the Saints. Marcus is now doing an athlete-focused VC fund that we will hear all about. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. Midge, we're gonna get into what everyone is doing in business. I wanna give everyone a chance to tell the crowd what they're up to. But I gotta start with this. We are lucky enough to have you here, but it's unfortunate for you. You made this year's USWNT, the Olympic team. You're not at the Olympics. What happened? Oh, we didn't, we didn't go over this yesterday. <laughs> um, I, I tore my ACL earlier this year, um, which was unfortunate, but um, God is good and it's a blessing in disguise. Tell us how you've been recovering and spending this time. Recovery's been fantastic. It actually gave me an opportunity to work on the off season, which is um, my company and a show that premieres this season um, in correspondence with the Indy Brazil playoffs. So I'm excited to tell you more about that, but um, it's, it's been good. Thank you for asking. Love talking about what athletes are doing in media, the streaming element, how you guys are going to distribute that show. So we'll get into that. Uh, Wale, can you tell everyone about what it is you do at UBS and, and the work with athletes? And so there's a lot of things that I do, but I think more importantly, one, working with our athletes and our entertainers um, and making sure that our advisors have the information that they need to put our athletes in the best position to build their legacies, right? So for us, it's, you know, if you look at our UBS logo is the keys, and I, and I love that logo for us because it's we're giving the keys to our, our clients, more importantly, but then also our, our advisors are equipped with the keys to help our clients think about life after sports, right? Because those 15 minutes of fame are just 15 minutes. And if we are able to plan right, do the right things, get around the right people, give them the right advice, um, those 15 minutes are able to expand into a real legacy. So for us at UBS, that and, and, and creating legacies for our clients is, is what I'm doing right now. There's so much there with uh, what I often call the new playbook for athlete investing. And we can kind of talk about that in a sec. But Marcus, uh, talk about choosing to go into venture capital and how you start up an athlete-focused fund. It's uh, a very different kind of thing, and it's also a very long-term play. You got to be patient. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this this trip um, is is kind of a round trip for me. Uh, I've been in VC um, even while I was playing. I was a, an active angel investor. Uh, I tried my hand at launching a fund back in 2017, 2018. Um, you know, in the gap in between, um, you know, just getting out into, into the world, gaining more experience, um, you know, as an executive coach, consultant, and, and just wearing a bunch of different hats. And when I got the opportunity to kind of circle back around to to this this opportunity here, um, it was one that, as you mentioned, the landscape had kind of shifted a little bit. Uh, you're starting to see more and more athletes get involved in businesses in different ways. And, you know, for me, the timing just felt right with with everything that's happening with within sport. Uh, the business of sport is changing, evolving. The role of the athlete within business is changing and evolving. Uh, it just felt like a really opportune time to launch a platform that was really focused on sports, really focused on growth stage sports opportunities, and really putting putting athletes at the forefront. Um, you know, and, and being able to drive this model. So uh, you know, a lot of time it's it's, it's really just you know, matching up the opportunity with the timing. And, and I, th I think we're, we're in a, a really unique uh, space and time right now to be able to do something like this. What have you been investing in in the past? What do you want to invest in with the new fund? Uh, as an individual, I've, I've kind of focused on that intersection of sports and business, uh, some health and, health and wellness. Uh, I was in the cannabis space for a while on the international scene. Um, but with the, within the fund, we're really focused on the value chain of sports. Uh, when you think about and when when we typically hear about sports investment, it's it's at the big five leagues. It's you know it's it's MLS, it's it's NFL, NBA. Uh, but we know that there are a ton of opportunities um, that that you know make up the value chain, make up all of the companies that make sports what it is. 
you know, from, you know, sports medicine to, you know, payment processing to technologies that are, that are you know, fueling performance. We, we see opportunities in, in the entire value chain and, and really being able to bring that value chain together as an opportunity to, to build a portfolio. Um, that's what we're really excited about right now. Love that. So we've talked about investing, talked about athletes planning and investing. Let's talk about media a little bit, Mitch. Uh, give everyone a little bit, if they haven't seen, about the show, the docuseries, which has already been filmed. What's the distribution plan? What's the hope and the goal with that first show from your company? Yeah, so the off-season is a docuseries reality television show. Um, it's the first of its kind. I call it a new genre that comes out, premieres this season uh, at the end of the inverse L season, so come October, November. Um, and it's premiering on Twitter, which is really unconventional, but intentional at the same time. Uh, the idea behind that was to go to, we had a lot of conversations with a bunch of networks, the Netflix, the Who's, HBO, but the subscription model isn't the best thing for a product that you want to reach too many people. And, that you need people to see who don't already know about it. So the idea was how can we get the maximum number of eyeballs on something that nobody knows what it is. So we decided to go through Twitter and along with my show, they are launching a new tab, a video tab, which will be on your app and a new TV app. So it will be on your televisions as well. Very cool. And your goal, as we discussed with the company, this is just the first offering from the off season, is kind of twofold. Bringing more attention on women's sports, fair to say, but also of course, the NWSL, the National Women's Soccer League. Uh, tell us a little bit about kind of that effort and uh, you are an NWSL champion. Uh, talk to us about, you know, how you think the league has gained more eyeballs, what still needs to happen in the, in the near future to get more people hip to the NWSL. Yeah, so the purpose of the show is to reform the way in which women and sport are marketed and consumed, and as well as the athletes themselves. I've always felt that the NWSL, as well as the way that women's sports in general is marketed, has been really derivative of men's sports. So I, I, play, I play in a women's soccer league, but everything is modeled after the European schedule. We call our uniforms kits instead of just like a jersey. Um, and it's the same thing with the MLS. We copy their structure and their game plans and we try to go into the same markets that they do. Um, and so the idea of doing the off season was trying to take a step back and look at the product that we have, which is completely different in a completely different audience and say, what's the correct way to market this? And for me, I felt you needed to tell stories because for men, for whatever reason, you guys can just like profit off of like performance and statistics. <laughs> I, I always talk about how my dad can listen to a baseball game and it'll be like man hit ball and got to base. And he'll be like, yes, this is great. <laughs> but, but me, I need to know who the man is and like why he's there and what his story is to, to be interested in it. So the idea of taking all of these athletes who are elite, high level, so good at their sport and then peeling back this lens and showing this is what they actually go through. This is their story. And allowing people to get to know those personalities and those narratives was the perfect way to kind of reform the way that we're marketed. Man, that's awesome. There's so much there. Uh, Wale, as we talk about sort of talking to athletes, both recently retired and still playing, because I feel like one shift in this whole model is everyone is thinking about these things much, much sooner. You know, it used to be, oh, I got to prepare for my second life. Now it's the minute you start. I mean, mid, you're so young and you're launching this show already and, and the athletes are doing it while they're still playing. Um, you said something interesting to me on our, on our pre-chat about even that there are things that athletes didn't used to have to think about, estate planning. I mean, things that they are asking about and planning for much sooner in their career. Yeah, I think, I mean, one, I think, you know, Mitch touched on it a little bit. At the end of the day, athletes are realizing that they're more than just athletes. I mean just look at us up on the stage, the ability for us to transition and use our skills and our hard work and our dedication to uh, pivot into any career we want to. And I think athletes are understanding that they're brands, right? They're businesses. And we look at them at UBS as businessmen and businesswomen. Um, a lot of times when we do talk to our, our clients, uh, we don't look at them as athletes. We look at them as a, a, a client that has a, a short period of time in, in, in the professional world, but we're looking at the long scale and looking at their brands. How do we build, again, when I said earlier, their legacy? So for us, because the athletes are making a ton of money um, early, especially with NIL now, it's imperative that they surround themselves with 
competent advisors, not just your mom or your brother or somebody that knows somebody, an uncle, which the way in the past, um, now it's time to really sit down with the experts like a UBS and some of our, you know, our competitors, but um, that have reputable um, reputations that uh, match our clients. When I was in, coming up in the NFL, I wasn't sure who to talk to. I didn't know that I should be in meetings with advisors from UBS, right? Because my mom knew a guy, and I trusted that guy, right? Now, that being said, I think the athletes are realizing that trust is good, but it's time to start verifying. And what you're seeing now, a lot of athletes are verifying by surrounding themselves with individuals, especially individuals here in this audience, but then also with, with firms like UBS and making sure that uh, we dot our I's and we cross our T's. And that's the biggest difference that I'm seeing with a lot of our athletes. We're not in that box anymore. And um, you're seeing, even with through COVID, um, markets, sports and entertainment is almost a bulletproof industry. Everybody wants to be entertained, no matter the time, the date, the structure, athletes and sports and entertainment will be needed. And we just hope that when uh, our clients and our prospects needs us, UBS will be there to answer that call. When you say athletes are, are the new brands now, I mean, yeah, a couple weeks ago, the New York Times style section, the front page said, athletes are the new everything. I thought that nails it. Uh, I want to ask both Midge and Marcus, you know, it, it's funny, Wale mentions it used to be like your cousin or your uncle would be in your ear. And that was a very common, you know, that, that was an old, used to be an easy sports business media story was about, you know, investing gone wrong or the athlete invested in a friend's business and it, and it went wrong. But there is, you know, not a downside, but there's a risk to being a current or former pro athlete who's out there saying, I've got money to invest. I mean, what uh, challenges have you guys already faced or tried to navigate when it comes to uh, making the right decisions and, and not being, you know, exploited? I think the one of the first challenges is, especially when you talk about investing, um, deal flow is however anyone can get to you, right? So um, deal flow has never really been a, a challenge for for folks that that are visible. It's it's quality deal flow, and it's how can you how can you vet really early on the companies that not just are they good companies, but are they good companies for me, my portfolio, and where I'm going? Um, you know, to to Wale's point, I, I think having the right advisors around you is key um, in, in that in that journey. But I, but I also think we're seeing a shift where athletes are taking a more active role within, within their own ecosystem. Um, you know, there was a point in time where it was kind of a stigma to be able to play your sport on the field and you were kind of looked down upon for doing stuff off the field, right? You're not focused or, or you know, the main thing is not the main thing. But I think athletes are, are really starting to reposition themselves and understand that they can do two things at one time. And I think the more we're seeing athletes become active, become you know, leaders within their ecosystem, not just clients, partners within their eco ecosystem, not just clients, um, I think that evolution will continue. And ultimately, to, to your point, like I wouldn't say we're everything, but we, we can do a lot. And the, the, the ability to kind of have these nuanced conversations around, yes, I'm an athlete, I can catch a ball really well, I can run routes, I can make plays on the field, but it doesn't define what interests me off the field. And you're starting to see people really follow those, those interests, whether it be media, uh, whether it be technology, whether it be um, you know these other industries that you're starting to see athletes really, really you know stake a claim in. Um, I think that evolution is just going to continue, and the more people that do it, the more people are going to see it. And you know, with NIL coming along, we're, we're going to start seeing people make that transition faster and faster and quicker and quicker. And um, you know, I think with that with that that trajectory, I think the sky is the limit for what athletes can do in the business world. Yeah, I, th I really agree with you. And I actually think that being an athlete is probably one of the only professions where your ability to do something really well also somehow suggests that you have an inability to do so many other things unwell. <laughs> um, but to answer your, your other question, it would probably just be financial literacy and prioritizing that. My dad's a stockbroker, so I feel like I grew up with that as a priority, so yeah. <laughs> no, I'd also listen, I'll add on that. I think the education part of it is, is huge. 
And then two, the fact that the world, not only just athletes, you know, say they have the money, but the world sees it, right? Anytime an, your favorite athlete signs a new contract, it's on the front page of the New York Times, of the USA Today. And for us as athletes, the, uh, it's not just our, our local community, our local ecosystem, like it was in the past, like your mom may have wanted you to open up a salon or an uncle wanted you now to uh, open up a, a, a gas station um, or a laundromat to make some, some cash flow. Now you're seeing these corporations and, and these funds coming at these athletes because they see the capital. And again, like I said in the past, even during tr trying times, these contracts are still being signed. So these corporations look at these athletes as guaranteed money that's going to continue to flow. And for us, like Mitch said, it's, it's huge for us as an industry to educate these athletes as they're going, hold their hands through the process, and then hopefully uh, build the legacy that I always talk about. Man, this is great. I, I always feel like we only get to barely scratch the surface. We're, we're almost up here, but I am certainly going to hound all three of these guys to do individual interviews with us at FOS, so check the site soon. Let's wrap this way. Uh, I've got three great speakers here, so I want to do a quick lightning round. Okay, we're going to do two questions in the lightning round. First up, can you name a couple pro athletes, current or former, that you personally really look to and think are doing it right when it comes to business decisions? We start with Wallace. Oh, man. <laughs> so obviously, we have confidentiality at UBS, but I think we have a ton that I work with that are doing amazing. Um, we got the right advisors. But for me, for public knowledge, I think a guy like Shaquille O'Neal is doing an amazing job. I was just talking earlier today about uh, with uh, Constance, who's here. Deion Sanders actually has done an amazing job with his brand and what he's doing. So light, lightning round. Uh, Simone Biles and Jason Kelsey. I'll go Ryan Neese and what he's doing with Next, uh, Next Legacy. Love that. Good lightning round answers. Next question. We've talked about so many different areas. We've said athletes are the new everything. They're brands. They're doing all kinds of different things. As we gaze into our crystal ball in the next five to ten years, which specific area is most interesting to each of you right now, whether it's a business category, uh, a, a certain type of venture? I'll say just, just the athlete business model is, is intriguing to me because it keeps changing, right? It, it started as endorser, it's become investor, um, entrepreneur. So, so that athlete business model evolution is, is interesting to me. Okay, um, I think the ownership, I think the next step is athletes now becoming owners. They will see with the Las Vegas basketball team that there's probably gonna be a prominent NBA player that's going to be the majority owner of that team. So I, I would say ownership of, of, NFL, I mean of uh, professional teams. Feel free to break some news if you haven't. No, not here, not today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cop out and jump on the ownership. That was a good answer. Very good, can we give these three a round of applause?